getting back to our series this week. <clears throat> is the New Testament Jewish? And this is part nine. Today is July 3rd. Happy Independence Day tomorrow to everybody. July 3rd, 2021, and on the Hebrew calendar, Esrim, it just went out of my head, Esrim Veshalosh, Betamuz, Hamashim Vesheva, Shmonim Veachad, 23rd day of Tammuz, 5781. And we want to start by saying, start today by saying, there were, at the time of Yeshua, there were a lot of halakhic disputes and debates going on. <clears throat> if you guys remember, I told you that uh, the, the group, um, was it the, I think it's the Am Amoraim, was the group of sages that were in operation that were um, uh, if you want to call them colleagues um, of Yeshua at the time. It's not really an accurate word. Um, what's that? You can say, yeah, contemporaries is probably a better word. Um, so these are the guys that were beginning to write down and codify uh, the Talmud. Okay, A lot of the writings that we now have today were being formed at that time. So there was a lot of uh, dispute and debate over halakha. And halakha, if you remember, is the Hebrew word for how you actually apply or, or live out. It's the legal rulings that dictate how you live out what the Torah says. Okay. So, a, probably the most famous example of this particular type of dispute and debate over halakha is um, Hillel and Shammai. Okay? They are, those two schools of thought um, are legendary. And this is the environment in which Yeshua uh, was operating. You know, when we, when we go back and we think about, we think about the period of time in which Yeshua came to the earth, was born to the earth. The, the, if we think about it at all, the tendency is to not necessarily credit a, a specific time period as being the perfect time for Yeshua to come. In our minds, we end up thinking well, He could have come any time. <coughs> well, that's not true. Um, we know that Hashem, the Father, doesn't ever do anything arbitrarily. Everything that he does is planned out, is purposeful. Um, so the timing of Yeshua coming into this world in Israel is, I mean, this was the time for him to come. It was, it was the perfect time for him to come. Hashem knew that Israel was, was in this 
they were almost like, it was almost like Israel was on a, a sea with big waves, okay? They're kind of being tossed around by their circumstances, by um, this process that the people of Israel are in, trying to finally develop and codify and write down expectations that they believe that Hashem <coughs> has on them uh, in order to fulfill the Torah. So, Hashem knew exactly what He was putting Yeshua into, the, the situation and the milieu. It was for this reason that it was so perfect that He came and began Himself expressing to the people of Israel, this is how you keep Torah. Because that was the big thing right at that point in time. Everybody is arguing and talking and disputing about how do you keep Torah. Okay. So Hashem sends Yeshua to put His own two cents in, okay, into the mix. And I'm, I'm just personally, I end up wondering just how much of what we ended up with and that we have today was influenced by Yeshua and His Talmudim. We already have seen signs of this in Sidurim. We've talked about this before, where there are prayers in the current Sidurim that are used today in Judaism prayers that were written by Shimon Kephas, I mean Peter. We suspect that in large part many of the things that we do during the Pesach Seder were actually inserted or influenced by the Messianic community. And there's no way for us to know and go back to see just exactly how much influence there is but there is a great deal of influence on what we have today from our Messianic brethren of the first century. So... Can I add something to that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yeshua was assuming that, um, that each thousand years from creation to the day where the greater light was created on the fourth day to give light to all the world. And so was Yeshua. In the fourth thousand year. Oh, very interesting. Uh, probably not everybody could hear that, and certainly not the people. Um, I'm sorry, my voice on, No, that, that's okay. Certainly not the people on the uh, live stream. But she was saying that uh, according to the schedule of the creation, that the greater light was. Uh, created on the fourth day, and that Yeshua, His appearing, was in the 4,000th year time period, because she's going back to what the Scripture has to say about a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. So, with healing in His wings. With healing in His wings, yes, yeah. With healing in His talit. Okay. Anyway, very, very good. Thank you. So sometimes these, these debates and these disputes became quite heated and contentious. Uh, there's a lot of stories about the arguments between uh, the schools of Hillel and Shammai, and sometimes they even became violent. Um, the disagreements with one another would lead to fights. <clears throat> but the Besorot, so the Gospels are full of various disputes between numerous groups. So we, this is like part of the landscape, part of the picture that is painted for us in the, in the Gospel accounts. 
So people might end up asking the question, so why, why were they arguing so much and so heatedly with one another over these things? Well, it's because it's important how we interpret what the Bible says. It, it impacts what we do, how we live. Yeah, it, yeah, it's still going on today. That's right. So this is one of the reasons. So in this very formative time period for Israel is one of the reasons that Yeshua came. The Father sent Him to have influence on the people of Israel as to how do you live out Torah. Okay. I want to read some excerpts here. Here's an example of a halakhic dispute from Matityahu, Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by, by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? This particular question was a hot topic in Yeshua's time. Since the Togah gives hardly any details about divorce laws, so if you go to Devogim, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, where it deals with divorce, there's actually not very much there. Okay? It's necessary to turn to another relevant text to derive more information. Yeshua, when asked this question, cited the creation account. Okay? So this is where we have in Matityahu chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, where Yeshua says, Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So He's actually taking this from Bereshit, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay? So since Devarim doesn't really cover the subject very much, Yeshua relies on what it says in Bereshit to give the answer to the issue of divorce. Yes? What's that? Uh, that is uh, Matityahu 19, verses 4 and 5. And if you hearken back to previous previous message in this series as to, um, you know, we, we started off with the four main rules, pardes, um, uh, of interpretation, and then we added some other, there are other rules of interpretation that were, that came after the creation of uh, pardes. Well, Yeshua is constructing using one of these interpretive uh, means to construct what's called a binyan of mikatuv echad. So, uh, again, I'll say it again so that you can get it. Binyan of mikatuv echad. If you go back and look at pre the previous messages where we covered these various interpretive styles, you'll get the definition exactly of what he was doing, okay? It's a general rule from one, so he's deriving a general rule from one t Torah passage from which we can learn more about divorce. Then he follows up with a derash on the creation text to answer their question in verse 6 of that same chapter. So he, he finishes with, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, 
let no one separate. Okay? So he is actually taking, he, he is, at, at this moment in time, he is forming halakha. Okay? Now, the, the people that came and asked him this question, they asked him trying to trap him. Okay? And he turns it on them and basically issues a, an halakhic statement derived from a binyan av mikatuv echad and a darash from gen, pulling from Genesis. Okay? This is all very, very Jewish stuff, okay? And we're trying to answer the question, is the New Testament Jewish? And by now, I, I know that you can say yes, but, you know, in the rest of the messages in the series, we want to show you exactly how this is Jewish, okay? And how Yeshua and His Talmudim use these interpretive measures to be able to do the same thing that the sages have done for eons, okay? Oh, this is true, yes. She said the, they added a lot of stuff that Yeshua didn't. After Yeshua had made His last entry into Jerusalem, He went to the temple and drove out the merchants who were illegally gouging people who came to purchase offerings. Now before I go on and we take a look at some scripture passages, I want to explain for those of you who are newer, the pe people who have been around for a long time already know this because I've talked about it. I did a message on this. Too often in Christian circles when they teach on this particular passage of Yeshua driving, you know, the, the King James Version says the money changers, drives them out of the temple with a whip and overturns the tables and all of that. Christians end up teaching this as they were not supposed to be there and they, and he was driving them all out of the temple. Well, that is not accurate, okay? They were supposed to be there. And let me, let me give you some understanding. When you as an individual needed to come to the temple for the purpose of making an offering, no matter what kind of offering it is, according to what Hashem told Moshe to write down in the Togah, any kind of offering that you were to give to Hashem needed to be without blemish, needed to be perfect, okay? So some people when they came to Jerusalem to make an offering had to come very long distances in order to get there. And they would bring what they considered to be a, a perfect sacrificial animal with them or animals, plural, okay, depending on what kind of sacrifice they were going to make. Well, you as an individual, you could make a determination about what you thought was, was an adequate sacrifice, but you're not the last say. When you get to the temple, now the priests have to look your animals over, and they're the ones who end up saying yay or nay. Okay? Well, if you live far away, you can't go back home and get, a and get a replacement animal and bring it back to the temple. And so there were booths set up in the temple intentionally that if the priest said your animal is not sufficient, not adequate, it it's, has a blemish, and you can't use it, then you would have to go to one of these booths and acquire a proper sacrificial animal to, to offer. 
what was actually going on in the temple compound. Not only were, were vendors there, and, and this, the whole the money changer thing also has to do with observant Jewish people that are living in other places that would come to make an offering, and they had to exchange the money from wherever they were from into temple shekels in order to pay whatever it is that they needed to pay. So again, the money changers were serving a purpose, a, a worshipful purpose, okay? The problem was that the, one, the people that were running these booths, they were using unjust weights and measures, or they were, for instance, the money changers were scamming the people and not giving them what the, the true equivalent of the money that they were being given in shekels to the person, okay? Or this is the biggest, the one, the one I'm about to tell you, this is the biggest scam that was going on, okay? Now remember, at this point in time, most of the people that are in charge in the temple have bought their positions. So they're not legitimate, actually legitimate priests not even the high priest, okay? Not legitimate. Okay, so this is a not a good situation at the time of Yeshua to begin with. But what, what was happening is the priests had a scam running with the animal vendors, okay? Where even if a person brought a a, an animal that didn't have any blemish, the priest would say, oh, it does have a blemish, and you can't use it. So you have to go over to, you have to go over to Yehoshua's booth over there and buy a new lamb, okay? So they would take that lamb, perfectly good lamb, that they had said had a blemish, take it in the back, and eventually said lamb ends up back in Yehoshua's bin over there for somebody else to buy, okay? And, and yes, so they were upcharging these people, and they were scamming people that came to worship God in the temple. That was what Yeshua was going after. It wasn't that these people weren't supposed to be there. It was that they were being dishonest and, and scamming the people who came to worship Him. Okay? So, He takes a whip and He goes after them, He turns the tables over, He runs them out. And what does He say in His rebuke? He draws upon two passages in His rebuke. What he says to them is, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Okay. So the, these passages we're going to actually take a look at, okay? Because again, this is sort of like what we've done in the past. Yeshua takes and uses passages that in their Peshat, when you go back and look at the passage, don't have anything to do with what's actually occurring and, and what he, the, the declaration that he is making to them. So let's go to Yeshiahu, Isaiah, chapter 56, verses 3 through 8, pages 525 and 585 in the Complete Jewish Bible and the Complete Jewish Study Bible. Yeshiahu, Isaiah, chapter 56. Verses 3 through 8. The passage actually says, A foreigner joining Adonai should not say, Adonai will separate me from his people. Likewise, the eunuch should not say, I am only a dried up tree. 
For here is what Adonai says, as, as for the eunuchs who keep my Shabbats, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant in my house, within my walls, I will give them power and a name greater than sons and daughters. I will give him an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai to serve him, to love the name of Adonai and to be, work, to be his workers, all who keep Shabbat and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Adonai Elohim says, He who gathers Israel's exiles, there are yet others I will gather besides those gathered already. And so we see the Peshat of this chapter is actually addressing foreigners who join themselves to Israel. It's, it's Adonai addressing them and saying, don't let your foreign status or your status as a eunuch make you say that I will not accept you. I do accept you. And I will accept your sacrifices in my temple. Okay? If you keep my Shabbat and not profane it, if you hold fast to my covenant, which I have made with my people Israel, if you'll hold fast to this covenant, I, you will be actually treated, because you're adopted, be treated better than natural born sons and daughters. Okay? So that's what the Peshat is. But he pulls this one section out. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Alright? The next passage that he draws from is Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, chapter 7, verses 1 through 15, page 559 and 623. Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah 7, 1 through 15. This word came to Yirmiyahu from Adonai. Stand at the gate of the house of Adonai and proclaim this word. Listen to the word of Adonai, all you from Yehuda who enter these gates to worship Adonai. Here is what Adonai Sva'ot, the God of Israel, says Improve your ways and actions, and I'll, I will let you stay in this place. Don't rely on that deceitful slogan. The temple of Adonai, the temple of Adonai. These buildings are the temple of Adonai. No, but if you really improve your ways and actions, if you really administer justice between people, if you stop oppressing foreigners, orphans, and widows, if you stop shedding innocent blood in this place, and if you stop following other gods to your own harm, then I will let you stay in this place in the land I gave to your ancestors forever and ever. Look, you are relying on deceitful words that can't do you any good. First you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, offer to Baal, and go after other gods that you haven't known. Then you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name, and say, we are saved so that you can go on doing these abominations. Do you regard this house which bears my name as a cave for bandits? So that's where he's drawing from, okay? I can see for myself what's going on, says Adonai. Go to the place in Shiloh that used to be mine, that used to bear my name, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. I spoke to you again and again, but you wouldn't listen. I called you, but you wouldn't answer. Now, says Adonai, because you have done all these things, I will do to the house that bears my name on which you rely, and to the place I gave you 
and your ancestors what I did to Shiloh. And I will drive you out of my presence, just as I drove out all your kinsmen, all the descendants of Ephraim. So this is a passage where Hashem is speaking to the people of the kingdom of Yehuda, and is saying, you go and do all of these things which are an abomination to me, and then you come in my house and think you're okay. And I'm telling you, you're not. And if you don't shape up, if you don't stop doing these things, then I'm driving you out, just like I drove Ephraim out, okay? So I continue with the excerpt. In the Peshat, Isaiah was painting his vision of the restoration of Israel after the exile. And Jeremiah scolded the temple authorities of his day by declaring what the temple should be as opposed to what they have made it. Yeshua used Jeremiah's scathing words to deliver the punchline of his rebuke. Once again, a kind of remez. Okay? So he's drawing from these two passages. And certainly, even it's in its Peshat, it's uh, just the natural reading of the text. This passage from Yirmiyahu is very apropos to what he's dealing with at the moment when he's driving those people out of the temple. Okay? Because they're they are there in the temple supposing that they're, they're getting away with what they're doing. And Yeshua knows what's going on, and He says, His actions and His words say, this should not be happening here. This is my Father's house. This is a house of prayer, a house of worship, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. Now we move on to the situation where Yeshua is on the cross. And this says, while Midrash often takes a verse out of his context to apply it in a different way, sometimes the intent is to cite one verse to recall an entire passage. Okay? After Yeshua had been on the cross for several hours, he cried out, everybody's, this is a famous declaration, everybody knows it, okay? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay? This is actually the beginning of Psalm 22. So let's actually take a look at Psalm 22. Tehillim 22, page 808, and 919. And we're going to read the entire psalm so, so we get the context of what's being said. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from helping me, so far from my anguished cries? My God, by day I call to you, but you don't answer. Likewise at night, but I get no relief. Nevertheless, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. If you our ancestors, in you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and escaped. They trusted in you and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me jeer at me. They sneer and shake their heads. He committed himself to Adonai, so let him rescue him. Let him set him free if he takes such delight in him. But you are the one who took me from the womb. 
You made me trust when I was on my mother's breasts. Since my birth, I've been thrown on you. You are my God from my mother's womb. Don't stay far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Wild bulls of Bashan close in on me. They open their mouths wide against me like ravening, roaring lions. I am pouring out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has become like wax. It melts inside me. My mouth is as dry as a fra fragment of a pot. My tongue sticks to my palate. You lay me down in the dust of death. Dogs are all around me. A pack of villains closes in on me like a lion at my hands and feet. I can count every one of my bones while they gaze at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves. For my clothing they throw dice. But you, Adonai, don't stay far away. My strength, come quickly to help me. Rescue me from the sword. My life from the power of the dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth. You have answered me from the wild bull's horns. I will proclaim your name to my kinsmen. Right there in the assembly I will praise you. You who fear Adonai, praise him. All descendants of Yaakov, glorify him. All descendants of Yisrael, stand in awe of him. For he has not despised or abhorred the poverty of the poor. He did not hide his face from him, but listened to his cry. Because of you I give praise in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the sight of those who fear him. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek God and I will praise him. Your hearts will enjoy life forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Adonai. All the clans of the nations will worship in your presence. For the kingdom belongs to Adonai and he rules the nations. All who prosper on the earth will eat and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, including him who can't keep himself alive. A descendant will serve him the next generation will be told of Adonai. They will come and proclaim His righteousness to a people yet unborn, that He is the one who did it. Now this is very definitely a messianic um, chapter. Okay, so it has it has the mysterious aspects of actually foretelling about Yeshua. But at the same time, David is writing this psalm speaking about the things that he's going through. Okay? But we know that David and the Messiah are constantly compared, not only in the Scripture, but by the sages. Okay. We're, we're told in the Word of God that the tabernacle of David will be restored. Well, and that David will sit on the throne. Well, it's not actually David the person. Okay? It is David was a foreshadowing of the Messiah who would eventually be on the throne forever. Now, the, this particular psalm was written by David as he fled from Shaul, okay, the king. By itself, the verse sounds like a cry of desperation. However, if you read the whole psalm, you find that it is not desperation at all. Like his ancestor David, Yeshua cried out in a desperate situation, but as a cry of hope, a declaration that God has not forsaken him. He cried out to God, believing that God would deliver him even from this. He chose this verse as a remez, paralleling his predicament to David's, hoping for a comparable outcome. 
David eventually reigned as king, and so will Yeshua, despite his current circumstance that he's going through at that moment on the cross. And he understands this. Okay. And I want to finish up then with a summary and, and a quote from the Talmud in Sanhedrin 97b. Okay. So in this, what we've shared, we've cited a few examples of Tanakh quotes, you know, in the, in the series over the last several messages, we've looked at various quotes in the book of Matthew. And we did this to make the point that when Yeshua or Matthew is quoting Tanakh, their quotes are generally not meant to be taken literally as Peshat. Instead, they are a Midrashic application of the cited verses to speak to a current event in their own life, whatever is going on at the moment. This was a common, and here's, here's the bottom line, this was a common and legitimate way to use the Scriptures in the Jewish world, and still is. Okay? So the people who, who want to say things like uh, they're misquoting the Tanakh, or they're misapplying these quotes to their situation when, when you go back and you look at where the quotes come from, the Peshat of that section doesn't have anything to do with what they're going through. Well, yes, this is true. We can't deny these things, okay? But it is common practice to do that within Judaism. So this is not, they're not doing something unusual. To illustrate, I offer a short segment from the Talmud, an argument between two rabbis, Eliezer and Joshua. At the end, now the, listen to the timing here, at the end of the first century CE, within decades of the writing of the Brit HaKadoshah, the New, New Covenant Scriptures. All right. Rabbi Eliezer said, If Israel repent, they will be redeemed, as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 3, uh, 3 verse 22, Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Rabbi Joshua said to him, But is it not written in Yeshiahu, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 3, You have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. You have sold your, yourselves for naught for idolatry, and you shall be redeemed without money, without repentance, and good deeds. Rabbi Eliezer retorted, But is it, is it not written in Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, Return unto me, and I will return unto you. Rabbi Joshua rejoined, But is it not written? In Yirmiyahu chapter 3, verse 14, For I am master over you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Okay? Do you understand what, what the argument is? Okay? This quote shows how the rabbis quoted Tanakh in this Midrashic way to support their positions. Eliezer held that repentance is necessary for redemption. Joshua said that God would sovereignly redeem Israel in His appointed time. It shows how they used Tanakh verses to support opposing points of view. I think you can see that the way they cite Tanakh is quite similar to the way that Matityahu does. And so, at this point, we're going to move on from the Besogot Gospel accounts, and we're going to actually, in the next um, few messages, we're going to start taking a look at the, the writings of the Apostles and how, how they ended up doing this as well. Specifically, we're going to take a look at um, Rav Shaul, Shimon Kefa, and 
uh, Yehuda or James. And um, we understand that, that to our Western minds, this kind of thinking and so on may be foreign, but this proves to everyone that the Brit HaKadoshah was not just some off-the-wall group of writings that people just made up without any parameters or any rules or anything like that. This, they're just following in the same processes and footsteps of all the other rabbinic sages of the time. Yes? Yes, yeah, you know, uh, this goes back to the whole uh, dialectical pair thing, okay? Because this is why dialect, the, dialectal, the knowledge about dialectical pairs is so important. Because what, what ends up wanting to happen in the world of theology and scholarship is the people who are trying to push their own particular bias and their own agenda, they only want to pick and choose the verses that support them and ignore the ones that go against what they have to say. Okay? And this is the reason why there's so much argument, so many denominations and so on. Whereas both concepts are taught in the scripture and you cannot Either, neither party can ignore that fact. I mean, you, you can, but you do it to your own detriment and to the detriment of those under whom, you know, under whom, you know, the people that sit under your teaching and you're teaching them and you're only teaching them one side of what the Bible says, okay, and ignoring the other side. So not only is it detrimental for you, but it's detrimental for them, the people that you are teaching. We can't, we can't do this. Okay? If, it's, if it is in the Word, it is true. No matter, what, no matter what is there, it is true. If we don't understand and can't figure out how the two things can be true simultaneously, the fault is with us, not with the Word of God. Okay? So we don't get to when we go, well, I don't know how these two things go together, so I'm just going to ignore the part that I don't like. We can't do that. So, yes. Will, will you pull those shades, uh, Clint, please? I'd like to say something about the dog. We talked about that today in the first dog. Oh, the, yeah, the, the vav. broken valve. Yes. Built uh -huh. from the Seattle, Washington area, El Shaddai ministry. Mm -hmm. He teaches that the Torah is 304,805 alphabetical letters. Now that's an uneven number. So there's 152,404 on one side, 152,404 on the other side, and there's one letter right in the middle of the Torah. And that letter is the Bob. Is a Bob. So yes. Mark does a great job in talking about the anomalies of the Torah and how different letters are larger sometimes mm -hmm. uh, for a reason. But I want to uh, yeah, uh, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is occasionally you'll see an upside down letter noon yes. uh, in there too. And so, so anyway. So getting back to the very middle of the Torah, you can find it in Leviticus. 1142, and I'll read, whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. Now that word belly is gakon in Hebrew, it's four letters, and the third letter is unusually long. It's bigger than all the others. Mm. It is the very center of the Torah. Mm. Now, when the Torah 
was put together, it consists of 248 columns. Every column is 42 lines long. And every column begins with the same alphabetical letter. Anybody want to guess what letter that is? Vav. 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 Every letter. Now you talk about inspiration of scripture. Could you write five books of the Bible, divide it into 248 columns, and have every column start with the same alphabetical letter and make any sense out of it? No, that full disclosure, disclosure, I've got to tell you, there are five exceptions. And they involve Elijah's name. Five times God spells Elijah's name differently than he does in the rest of Scripture. Five times he takes the Bob out of Elijah's name and he puts it in Jacob's name. Hmm. He takes the Vav out of Elijah's name and puts it in Jacob's name. So, yes, though, oh, I, I actually, I love those kinds of revelations. I mean, they're just awesome. And when you, when you hear these things or see them for yourself, you absolutely know that there was no way that a human being could have done this. Okay? So... Anyway, all right, let's pray. Abba, we thank you. Thank you for your amazing word. <sighs> Father, we love it. We love looking into it. We love learning about it. We love the jewels that are hidden in it. So, Father, as we, as we continue in this series, reveal more and more, Father, to us. We're looking, Father, for you to, to teach us the things that we need to know, that we might be the kind of servants that you need us to be, and we can give witness to how great you are. In Yeshua's name, amen.